any questions. We've only handed out uh, two or three hundred, so if you're missing one, uh, they're here. Okay, and for those of you that are new, uh, we're going through all the uh, major creation texts of the Bible. We're now in the book of Isaiah. And uh, this is not going to be a commentary of the book of Isaiah. We're just focusing on those texts of Isaiah that have to do uh, with uh, science and uh, creation. However, of all the books of the Bible, Isaiah has more to say with the exception of the book of Job. So we will be spending some time in the, the book of Isaiah. And uh, you know, last week we were kind of collecting the scripture passages that uh, will help us with question number one. What does Isaiah say about the, the beginning of the universe and how God brings about the uh, universe? <coughs> so we're collecting some passages and we'll be studying each passage uh, in some depth. Uh, but I was using this image as a background uh, for my slides last week and somebody came up and said, what are those things that you see up there? Okay, quick question. I think they're <laughs> <laughs> Well, <coughs> does anybody recognize what these objects are? Pardon me? Galaxy, galaxy? They are galaxies. Do you know which ones they are? Very far away. Well, actually, not so far away. Okay. You're all forgiven because these are objects you can't see in the Northern Hemisphere. You can only see them if you're in South Africa or Australia or toward down towards Argentina or Chile. These are the large and small Magellanic clouds. And uh, they rank as the... Uh, fourth and fifth largest galaxies in the galaxy cluster in which our Milky Way galaxy is located. Uh, this object right here, I should be going over here because of the live streaming, I'm sorry. Uh, I keep reminding, thank you for having that little orange uh, tab there, it tells me. This object is actually part of our galaxy. Uh, it's 47 Tucani, uh, which is the second largest globular cluster in our Milky Way galaxy and it's the oldest of the globular clusters in our Milky Way uh, galaxy. So that's a foreground object, and small Magellanic cloud and large Magellanic cloud. Now for those of you who have been with us for over a year, remember we actually had a little talk about uh, the significance of these galaxies? Anybody remember that? Oh, we do have someone who remembers that. Yeah, what's so important? <coughs> the star formation in our galaxy and the state. Yes. Okay, they happen to be in the precise position to guide much smaller dwarf galaxies in the local group into the center of the Milky Way galaxy, and that's critical for sustaining the spiral structure of our Milky Way galaxy. The spiral structure you see has been stable literally for 10 billion years, and it's because of the large and small Magellanic cloud. So. Uh, this Sunday, uh, when you want to thank God over a meal, you might want to add the small and large Magellanic clouds <laughs> as things you can thank God for because we wouldn't be here if the small and large Magellanic clouds weren't exactly the mass that they are and positioned the way they are so that they can act as the fine-tuned funnel to bring in these tiny dwarf galaxies uh, into the Milky Way and give us the spiral structure we need for advanced light. Okay. We can turn the lights back on. One other thing I wanted to talk about before we jump into our lesson on the book of Isaiah, I wanted to thank some of you for jumping in on the debate that happened on my Facebook page. And frankly, I did not think there'd be any debate. What I did is I just posted an article <laughs> on uh, water baptism. And you know, it's like, what could be... <laughs> <laughs> what could be controversial about that? <laughs> Uh, well, what I discovered is, uh, and I was kind of alerted to this by someone else, that there's a growing movement within Christianity uh, to abandon the sacraments. Mm -hmm. And so they basically are churches where they don't do water baptisms, and some of them don't do communion either. Uh, but the new thing where they basically say, well, that was for the Book of Acts Christians. It's not for us today, uh, that that's literally been gone away. And so I was making a comment on that in my little piece. Well, what I was aware, a big debate happened. People say we shouldn't be doing baptisms at all. And of course, there's another whole uh, group of uh, churches uh, who insist if you're not water baptized, you don't, you're not saved. You don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you're headed for hell and water baptism is not 
you know, it's a command. There was a big debate where people said it's a symbol and said no, no way, it's not a symbol. Uh, so, okay. I want you to be at least prepared for this because I was caught off a little bit. You know what was fun though? I just let the debate run. So I had all these people who thought, you know, baptism is not important at all. We shouldn't be doing it. Other people saying you've got to do it to be saved. And uh, several of you jumped in and said, there's a middle position here we need to pay attention to. And yeah, I love the way people cited scripture passages. Basically making the point that there's two baptisms the Bible talks about. <coughs> Okay, what's the other baptism besides water baptism? Baptism of the Holy, baptism Spirit. Of the Holy Spirit, right. And uh, what is the importance of water baptism? It's a symbol. But it's a s more than just a symbol. What I put in my little piece is it's a symbol and a down payment, uh, a guarantee. And, uh, you know, an analogy I use, and a lot of people didn't like my analogy, is that, uh, you know, when I do weddings, I have the couple <coughs> exchange rings. In some countries, only the bride uh, has a ring. But I think it's really good that both exchange rings. And when we do the ring part of the wedding ceremony, I explain to the bride and groom, these rings that you're giving to one another are a symbol and a down payment a down payment in the same way that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a down payment. It's the Holy Spirit uh, giving you uh, this spirit baptism as a guarantee that God will fulfill all the promises he has made for you in this life and the life to come. And so it's something that's of value. And that's why it's important that the rings, you know, cost more than, you know, a few nickels. Because... Uh, you're basically saying to uh, the person you're marrying, uh, this is a valuable ring and it's a down payment, a guarantee, a symbol uh, that I will fulfill all the commitments that I'm making to you uh, this day. Well, likewise, uh, that's what spirit baptism is. But let's turn the corner around here. Water baptism, it's a symbol and it's a down payment. And incidentally, what also happened on my Facebook page as another debate worked out. <laughs> and this is a debate over what's called uh, uh, Jesus as Savior versus Jesus as Lord. And so it's what's called, uh, you know, Lordship salvation uh, versus grace salvation. And it's like, you know, the church has been debating this for a long time, uh, but again, there's a balance. <coughs> Becoming a Christian is making Jesus Savior and Lord. And there's no work that's necessary to make him a savior. But part of it is basically saying, hey, I'm making Jesus the most important person in my life. I'm committing myself to serve him. And therefore, he's not only your savior, he's your Lord. You're basically saying, and this is something that hit me when I gave my life to Christ, is realizing God knows better than I do what's best for me. And so it simply only makes rational sense I put him in charge of my life because he knows better than I do what's best for me. And so, and water baptism basically is that very thing. It's the first command that God gives to the new believer to be water baptized. But what's interesting in the Facebook debate, realizing a lot of churches really don't do water baptism the way I think the New Testament is talking about water baptism. And of course, there's a big debate. Do we go fully immersed? Or do we just sprinkle people? And infant baptism versus adult baptism. So yeah, five different debates were running. So you can imagine why there's so many comments there. Uh, but again, I, what I kind of like to do, I do jump in a little bit once in a while and throw my two cents worth in, but I think it's great. Just let these people debate one another. If they debate long enough, they'll probably figure it out. And a lot of them did, so that was good. <coughs> but yeah. I have a question about, about the galaxy. Yes. Does the galaxy continue to grow forever? Uh, is 
it even known, or does perhaps a black hole start eating some of the mass? Yes, our Milky Way galaxy, because it is consuming the food of eating tiny dwarf galaxies, is getting bigger and bigger. You know, today it weighs in at about one trillion times the mass of our star, the Sun. Uh, but the galaxies it's consuming are quite small galaxies. It doesn't really make that much difference to its total mass. It's like consuming 0.001%. Uh, but it keeps doing that on a regular basis. Now, if it were to consume the Large Magellanic Cloud, it would distort the structure of our galaxy and make it uninhabitable for advanced life. It's critical that we be consuming tiny dwarf galaxies, not the ones as big as the Large and Small Magellanic Cloud. And a good example of that is what happened to the Andromeda Galaxy. There is a nearby galaxy, actually smaller than the Small Magellanic Cloud, and it passed through uh, one of the outer parts of the spiral arm structure, warped the entire uh, spiral arm structure of the Andromeda Galaxy. And almost all spiral galaxies look like the Andromeda Galaxy. Uh, in fact, uh, I think it was a Sunday about a year ago, I showed you a <coughs> montage of spiral galaxies that look as close as possible to our Milky Way Galaxy. Every one of them is distorted distorted sufficiently uh, to be uninhabitable for advanced light. So, I don't know if you're a Star Wars fan where it says a galaxy far, far <laughs> away. I can tell you, we astronomers have looked far, far away. We don't see any candidates. So, I think the next Star Wars movie, they've got to put it inside our Milky Way galaxy because it can't be some other galaxy. Uh, we've searched and they're not there. So, uh, but the reason why ours is unique is that it's been getting this diet, because what happens if it doesn't consume tiny dwarf galaxies, the spiral structure collapses, and you get what's called a spherical or elliptical galaxy, where the stars are too close together for advanced light to be possible. Uh, but if you consume a somewhat larger dwarf galaxy, it distorts the structure enough uh, to make it uninhabitable for advanced light. Uh, but that's one of the miracles of our Milky Way galaxy. It's had this very regular steady diet of tiny dwarf galaxies. For example, if you consume three over the course of 100 million years and you go a half billion years without consuming any, that's bad news uh, for the galaxy. But we've had this regular steady diet. So to put it another way, our Milky Way galaxy is like a human being having three meals a day every day uh, at regular times. Uh, but it's thanks to the large and small Magellanic Cloud and the fact that we live in a unique a cluster of galaxies. There is no cluster of galaxies like our local group. It's got two big galaxies, no giant galaxies, and about a hundred uh, dwarf galaxies. And that's what's left right now. It had more in the past. Uh, but it's because of the unique cluster we live in and the large and small Magellanic Cloud that we can actually have the Sunday school class today. <laughs> All right, Jim. Does the central hit the hole in the middle of the galaxy? It's consuming the mass of the galaxy, right? A bit at a time to get back to <coughs> what's coming in? Well, that's another unique feature of our Milky Way galaxy. All galaxies that are relatively large, in fact, all galaxies, period, have a black hole at their core. Um, and galaxies that are size of our Milky Way typically have a central black hole that weighs in anywhere from uh, 30 to several billion times the mass of our star, the Sun. What's unique about our Milky Way galaxy, it's a big galaxy with a tiny central black hole. Our central black hole weighs in at only two to three million times the mass of our star, the Sun. And because it's so small, relatively speaking, it doesn't disturb the spiral structure of our galaxy. And it doesn't throw out radiation uh, that would wipe us out. However, if our star were any closer to the center of our galaxy than it is, then we would be in trouble from the radiation being emitted from that central black hole. Uh, but if we had a black hole that was slightly larger, we'd be in trouble even where we are right now. Does the black hole get larger? As it does. The black hole uh, is getting bigger and bigger because it's consuming gas 
and every once in a while it, it consumes a star. And when it consumes a star, you get a big blast of uh, deadly uh, radiation. Now, what protects us too, incidentally, all of this is in the book Improbable Planet, the first four chapters. Uh, but the other unique feature is when our sun goes around the center of our galaxy in its orbit, it has very little up and down movement. And because of its very tiny up and down movement, it gets shielded by the dust that exists in the plane of our galaxy, and that prevents us from being exterminated by the deadly radiation from the central black hole. You say, well, couldn't God put us in a galaxy without a central black hole? It wouldn't be large enough to have the spiral structure we need uh, for advanced life. So yeah, everything's just right, and we're a little off topic, so uh, let me try to bring us back. Yes? Okay, uh, black holes are not holes. What they are are highly condensed clumps of matter. Uh, where uh, if you get a big enough clump of matter that uh, contracts enough, it reaches a point where uh, gravity just keeps it shrinking forever, almost forever. And so, you know, black holes are just collapsing under their own gravity. So all black holes are getting smaller and smaller but they keep sucking in gas and stars so they get bigger and bigger in terms of their mass. But eventually they get so small that they reach the diameter of, say, uh, a proton. And when they get that tiny, uh, everything that got trapped into that black hole quantum tunnels out and it becomes a white hole. Now, one reason why we know the universe is not extremely old, we don't see any white holes. We only see black holes. The universe is not old enough for there to be any white holes. <clears throat> Say, how long do you have to wait? Well, the bigger the black hole, the longer it takes to become a white hole. The smallest black hole we observe has a white hole uh, time period of 10 to the 66 years. So since the universe is only 10 to the 10 years old, there are no white holes. <laughs> so universe is not old enough. Uh, and also what we notice is our universe is so young, there are no black dwarfs. There are no completely burnt out stars. The universe isn't old enough for a star to completely burn out. So we got brown dwarfs, we got red dwarfs, but no black dwarfs. We got white dwarfs. All white dwarf stars will become black dwarfs if you wait long enough. But the universe isn't old enough for that to happen. Okay. Let's see if we can get back on top. Yeah, we were talking about water baptism, weren't we? Okay. <clears throat> and we're going to get to Isaiah. So let me try to wrap this up quickly. Oh, yeah, Isaiah, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, one of the things that uh, I used to be the fellow who did the baptisms in this church, uh, but what we would do in the baptismal services, before we would actually do the baptisms, we would look at all the New Testament texts on water baptism and spirit baptism, which took about you know, 12 to 15 minutes to go through those texts. But what's interesting about those texts, number one, when we would read the ones about spirit baptism, Ephesians 1 refers to it as a down payment and a guarantee. And you know, what is the baptism in the Holy Spirit? It's God filling you, as it says in the book of Philippians, with a desire and the power to do the will of God. It's not how many times you attend church or how much prayer you do or how much Bible study you do. But yeah, the sign of someone really being truly born again is that they have new desires and new powers they didn't have before. And so uh, they have a desire, for example, to study what God's Word is all about. And it's much more illuminating and joyful for them than it was uh, before. And I tell new believers, when you experience that, and when I became a, a Christian, it was an immediate experience. The d new desires and powers were really evident um, even before I really did much in the way of these Christian practices. And that's basically God saying, that's the guarantee that you're in uh, with me and I will fulfill all the promises that for your life uh, now, in the future, and in the future life to come. 
But likewise, uh, and, and then uh, when you go to uh, 1 Peter 3, uh, verse 21, it refers to water baptism. And notice it says in 1 Peter 3, 21, that water baptism is a symbol. It actually uses the word symbol and makes the point that it symbolizes the baptism that does save you. It's not the removal of water and dirt from the body. So it's basically making the point the water baptism is a symbol of the baptism that does save you. On the other hand, it's critical in that it demonstrates I am committed uh, to make Jesus Christ the most important person in my life. That's the first command he gives me. I'm going through with it. However, it's also an opportunity to testify. And to me, that's what's so significant about both communion and water baptism. It's an evangelistic tool that God gave us because of the powerful symbolism. And so in this church, uh, we do deep water baptisms. Why? Because the water, when you go down into the water, it symbolizes you saying no to your old life. You die to the old man. But you don't stay at the bottom of the tank. You come up. <laughs> and that symbolizes the resurrection we have in Christ, where we become the new man, where no longer am I the boss of my life, running my life. I put Jesus Christ in charge. That's the new life I have in Christ. And so it gives you a very good um, object lesson of what salvation is all about. But I'm convinced it must be accompanied by a testimony. And it needs to be public. So I don't do private baptisms. When I do a baptism, I say, you, want, you need to invite your friends, your relatives, and especially your unsaved friends and relatives. In fact, uh, we would actually print invitation cards. Okay, you want to get water baptized? Here's an invitation that you can hand out to different people and invite them to come. Because there are people that will never darken the door of a church, but they'll come for a wedding or a funeral or a baptismal service or a baby dedication. So take advantage of that. So I hand out these invitation cards, get them to come. And then, you know, when I would do these water baptisms, I would sit down with the people who wanted to be baptized and said, let's work on your personal testimony. Because when you're in the tank, I'm going to have you give your story of how you came to faith in Jesus Christ, and that's your opportunity to have a significant impact on your unsaved friends and relatives. And probably the most dramatic one I remember, it was a 10-year-old boy. He was the first one to come to Christ in his family. He invited all of his relatives to come, and there were about 40 that were over there in the Old North Church uh, that came to hear him. And uh, you know, we worked on his testimony, but the day of the baptism, he said, do you mind if I give a longer one than what I gave uh, to you? And I said, yeah, that's fine. Take whatever time you need. Well, he took 10 minutes. Powerful testimony. He had people in tears, and many gave their life to Christ just from the testimony of the one 10-year-old boy. And the doctrine that he built into it, it's just an incredible message that he gave. And what I tell people is, don't blow the opportunity. Uh, so, you know, and again, it's you basically publicly saying, this is Jesus Christ, the most important person in my life. So I'm basically telling people, you know, all this debate you're having about uh, whether or not uh, this is necessary, it's like, look at the fact that this is God giving us an evangelistic opportunity. Why would you want to throw that away? Take advantage of it. And I think communion is the same way. And so, you know, when we would do uh, Bible study retreats up in the Sierras, we would have communion and people would walk by and say, what's going on here? Say, well, let, let us explain it to you, uh, what this all means. I won't go into that because I know we need to get to the book of Isaiah. Okay. <laughs> you got the study question there. Let me just read the question for you. And there's 10 questions we're going to be getting at as you go through this uh, study set. What Isaiah passages address the beginning of the universe? What do these passages say about the universe? And how can we use these Isaiah texts to persuade people that God exists and the Bible is the word of God. And what we did last week, uh, I challenged all of you to break up into groups of five, it was five or six, and what we did is we read through the entire book of Isaiah in 15 minutes. And basically it was an exercise. Okay, there's so much content in the book of Isaiah, it's easy to get distracted. I mean, tons of subjects are there. And if you try to assimilate it all, you'll never make it through 
uh, in even a few hours, let alone 15 minutes. But the challenge it gave you is this. I want you to speed read through the book of Isaiah and pick out all the verses that you think are relevant to the beginning of the universe or how God uh, creates the universe um, in a way that sets things up for the future. Because we've got a follow-up question. What does the book of Isaiah say about what God's plans to bring it to an end to the universe? So I said, skip those parts. Only look for those texts that talk about the beginning of the universe and how God brings about the beginning of the universe. And uh, try to be reasonably exhaustive. And what I notice is you're all able to pull it off. Every group finished in under 15 minutes. Although a lot of you were kind of using your smartphone saying, okay, I'm going to search for a heavens and earth. And you collected a whole bunch of passages that way. Look for the word create, collect a bunch of passages that way. Didn't speed read, you'd use Google. Yeah, right. Well, that's what's wonderful about being alive today. In fact, I was actually doing a little study as you were all in your small groups. 60% of you were doing this survey with smartphones, not with real print, print uh, Bibles. So incidentally, I always think it's best to do both. So yeah, I like uh, my smartphone. It's got 40 different translations on it. So uh, that's great. And you've got links to uh, different Bible aids. We do live in an amazing age. And you can make the print as big or as small as you want, which is something I can't do with my uh, printed text here. So there are advantages. But I've also noticed it's easier to remember where things are when you're looking at a print edition than, uh, say, an uh, electronic edition. And that's something I've noticed that reasons to believe. People want both the ebook and the print book. And there's a reason why. And that's what I like to do when I get books. I get both because uh, there are advantages to having both. I'm on an airplane, it's great to have it all on a phone and uh, be able to access it at any time. But if I want to kind of remember and take notes, I prefer uh, the print edition. And we're going to be doing that in this class, looking at these questions, basically speed reading through the book of Isaiah, collecting the passages, and okay, kind of what we're going to be doing this morning. I've got all these verses here. Here's a few of them. We actually found up about 30, uh, it's actually 29 different passages you collected. And uh, I told you to be, um, you know, a little more uh, generous than conservative. So if you've got any doubts about whether this passage sticks or not, include it. Because what we're going to do now, we're going to go through all these texts and we're going to throw away the ones that have no relevance. We're going to keep the ones that have relevance. Then we're actually going to study each text at a time. And that's kind of how we're going to be going through uh, these questions. But it's basically kind of a training exercise because this, you know, how do you actually, you know, study the text in depth? Focus on one topic only. You know, this, this is a critique I got of people reading through the Bible in one year or two years. They read through it in one or two years trying to get everything out of it they possibly can, and you can't. There's too much in the Bible. Rather, you need to have a different goal. I'm going to be reading through the entire Bible 30 different times. But each time I read through it, I'm going to be looking for one thing. And that's kind of how this whole class study began, reading through the entire Bible, looking at all the texts relevant uh, to uh, creation, and then going back over it in uh, some depth. So that's what we're doing here in the book of Isaiah. But yeah, uh, you collected 29 passages, and we did all that in 15 minutes. And so we got the verses. I told you, don't try to understand the passages. Just write them down. Later, we're going to go back and actually see what they say. So that's how you're able to get through it quickly. Just simply collect the passages. And once the passages are collected, you go back over it. You trim the list down. Then you study it in depth. Okay, so what we're going to be doing now is looking at these texts. And you'll, you notice I put them all in order because last week we just had them all jumbled up. Uh, but now we've got them all in order. We're going to go through these one at a time and say, ask the question. Does this belong to study question one, or does it belong to one of the other nine questions that we ask, which case we'll pick it up later? And if it belongs, we keep it. If it doesn't belong, uh, we take it down. And uh, I'm guessing we're going to run around somewhere around the low 20s of the passages that we keep and we study in depth. So the first one is Isaiah 4.5. Is that a keeper? Or do we uh, not include it? Do I have a volunteer who wants to read Isaiah 4 or 5 for us? Hey, you've got all your smartphones here. This shouldn't be difficult. So uh, a volunteer for Isaiah 4 or 5. All right. 
Okay, nice and loud. By the way, um, why don't we have the people come up here so we can get this for the live streaming? Okay. Isaiah 4, 5. A little closer to the mic. Then the Lord will create over the whole area of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day, even smoke, and the brightness of a flaming fire by night, for over all the glory will be a canopy. Okay, is that something we include? Is it relevant to the beginning of the universe? What do you think? Some say no, some say yes. We've got a debate going on here. So how do we settle the debate? So, those of you who say yes, why do you say yes? Okay. It sounds like he's talking about the creation of, of the firmament and the canopy above and then below. It sounds to me like the beginning of the universe. Okay. Uh, those of you who say no, why do you say no? In the back? Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, go ahead. In the very beginning of the chapter, it talks about those who are, in verse 3, those who are left in Zion who remain in Jerusalem will be called holy, but it's talking about that event, and that's not a creation event, that's an event. Okay, you're making a good point, because you know, if you just look at that one verse, I can see why some would say yes and some would say no. Okay, look at the verse before, look at the verse after. Look at the whole paragraph. What is the context? Is the context anything relevant to the beginning of the universe? Yeah. Okay, do we have a consensus? Okay. So we can take <coughs> Isaiah 4 or 5. And incidentally, that's the rule you do when we're going to have, so that's kind of how we're going to proceed with this. Whoops. Let me go back. Well, I'll just remember that. Okay, next one. Isaiah 6, 3 to 4. And do we have a volunteer to read Isaiah 6, 3 to 4? And part of what we might be doing, you'll notice that some of these texts like Isaiah 40, 12 to 17, what I'm going to be doing is saying, how much of that is relevant? Or can we drop a verse or two out of that passage? So we're going to be looking at that too. Or you might come on and say, you know what? Isaiah 40, 23 is also relevant. We should add that to 22. So that's part of the exercise we're going to be doing. But Isaiah 6, 3 to 4. Okay? Yeah, go, come up here. Thank you. Isaiah 6, 3 to 4. This is uh, from the easy, easy read version. Um, the angels were calling to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, all-powerful. His glory fills the whole earth. The sound was so loud that if it caused the frame around the door to shake, and the, t and the temple was filled with smoke. Okay. <clears throat> now, a lot of you thought that that should be uh, included, so can you give me a reason why you think it should be included? I see some of you shaking your heads. we got another debate here. You know, we're going to get to some texts where there's no debate, but uh, <laughs> yes. Isaiah 6, what do you think? Because I can see arguments on both sides, so I'd like to hear the arguments. Okay. I saw a hand somewhere, yes. You think arguments against? I'll take either one, whatever you want. Yeah, it's giving you the date when he had the vision. So you might make an argument. Maybe we should drop verse 3 and just keep verse 4. That's a possibility. But what about verse 4? Well, part of the vision that he's had in the year the king Uzziah died. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, well, okay. I guess 
two parts. First, it says the whole earth is full of joy, speaking of creation, the whole earth. And then I think I think the more important part is <coughs> and the foundations of the threshold of the voice. Look at his voice. Okay, so that says this is creation. It's talk. It tells about what's happening. So that's so I, I think. Yeah, and notice it talks about how the glory fills all of his creation. So you could argue, hey, that's a significant theological point, that God creates the universe in such a way that his glory fills everything that he creates. So that could be a good argument for including it. Yes? Well, he, this is a personal call of Isaiah to be a prophet. Yes. It's a personal call. He's giving a testimony here. Right. So that be a good reason that maybe you want to chop verse 3 from it. So do we chop verse 3 and keep verse 4? That's a possibility. You want to kill the whole thing. Okay. Say none of it is really relevant. Anybody else want to jump in on this? It's talking about heaven. So. But it does mention earth explicitly. Yes. Okay, that's a point we can make from a 21st century perspective. Uh, the Earth didn't exist at the beginning of the universe. Uh, but I've heard people argue on this text that this is implying that God created the universe with the Earth in mind. So the very act of creation was for the purpose of making the Earth possible. That's a 21st century concept. That's a 21st century concept as well, correct? And people have made the point, notice, that there is no word in biblical Hebrew for universe you got this phrase, the heavens and the earth. Then you got the phrase, heaven and earth, which heaven and earth is a reference to the physical creation and the spiritual creation. But people have pointed out that in that context, there are places in the Old Testament where earth refers to more than the earth. So this gets complicated. So, in the back. Well, that's part of the challenge we're going to be facing. Again, I'll make the point. There is no biblical Hebrew word for universe. You've got this phrase, Shammayan arrest, with the definite articles. And that's used nine times in the Old Testament. Every time you see the heavens and the earth in the English translation, it's referring to the entire universe. It's wrong to take it as galaxies, stars, and planet Earth. No, it's referring to matter, energy, space, and time. And so this is where we get into some difficulty. When you see this word earth, exactly what is it talking about? And you've got to look at the larger context to get an idea. Okay? I saw another hand. Somebody? No? Okay. Over here? Yes. I would argue that this is an event that takes place in the temple in which the angels are declaring the glory of God, not actually the event itself, but saying this is what happened the glory of God fills everything. Lots well, a good point, but it might be relevant. The angels are basically making a statement about how God created. So, you know, kind of what I'm hearing is that, you know, we're having this debate, but it's probably worth keeping the verse just because it does explicitly mention uh, earth, talks about how God uh, creates in a way that his glory fills everything. So, I think we probably ought to include it, but maybe we drop verse 3, because verse 3 really doesn't tie in to creation. And yeah, it is in the larger context of Isaiah being commissioned uh, for his ministry, but yeah, you got the angels making a declaration about creation. Yeah. So verse 4 talks about the foundations of the thresholds. It seems to me that they're talking about the thresholds of the temple were shaken. Right. So they were shaken. But then we've got this comment about the earth and the glory. 
And you know, <coughs> pardon me. Well, I'm thinking it's probably verse four is worth keeping. And you know what? Here, here's how we're going to proceed with this study. If we can't settle it, we keep it, okay? Because it might be relevant when we start digging into the other passages. Yeah, okay. Read verse 3, okay. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Yeah, I see what you mean. We ought to keep both. And you know what? Or let four go. Well, okay. But here's the principle we're going to apply. If we can't settle it where we're kind of unanimous about what we should do with the passage, we keep it. Because we could always throw it away later. But you know, as we look at the other verses, we may discover that, that there's, there's links that we didn't see, in which case you're better off keeping it. And then, so I think we ought to keep it. And we can, if we prove it, it doesn't work later, then we can let it go. Okay, Isaiah 14, 12 to 13. Let's uh, turn to that. There's a question. Here. Question, yes. Maybe we, maybe we should uh, assign a, a, a number to them. Like th this one's a medium warm, and this one's a medium, no. uh, <laughs> medium Okay, warm. rare, medium well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could do that, put a number system on it. But you know, I think we ought to hold off on that because. The way scripture is, there are verses that cross-reference other verses. And we may see some links that we're not seeing right now. So unless it's clearly something that's not relevant, we ought to probably keep it. Okay, Isaiah chapter 14. Got you got it? Fantastic. Uh, King James. <clears throat> How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Is that right? Right. Okay. How many of you vote that uh, we should keep this passage? Not a lot of votes. Yeah. Okay, we got one here. How many think we ought to toss it out? A lot of you think we ought to toss it out. Okay, those of you who think we ought to toss it out, why? Yes? It's really talking about Satan's rebellion, about Lucifer's rebellion. Yes, the topic's really Satan. Yeah. And although Satan does refer to heaven and earth, right. it's really not talking about creation. Now, here's how I think this passage got included. It was somebody with their smartphone doing a Google search on heaven. Well, not all the passages that talk about heaven are talking about the beginning of the universe. So, however, we might get a different story on Isaiah 14:24. Uh, do anybody want to take a look at that? Volunteer to come up here and read it. You know what, I'm reading it right here. I think we can settle this quickly. I'll rise up against them, declares the Lord Almighty. I will uh, cut off from Babylon her name and survivors, her offspring and her descendants, declares the Lord. I don't think that's relevant. Okay, it's basically talking what's going to happen to the Israelites when they're in Babylon. Uh, what about verse 27? For the Lord Almighty has proposed, and who can thwart him? His hand is stretched out, and who can turn it back? Yeah, I think that's how it got included, uh, and I heard people talking about it, because Isaiah speaks more about the stretching out of the heavens than any other book of the Bible, and this may be a significant cross-reference. It may not be but it might be worth keeping just to see what all the other passages about stretching out say. Yes? I think in this instance it talks about God's omnipotence of his yeah. hand not being short, being able to stretch out to do anything other than stretching out heaven's hand. Well, in that case, it's relevant, independent of the God expanding the universe. So that would be another vote for maybe uh, keeping it in. And again, if it proves not to be relevant, we can drop it. But it would be interesting to see 
if there's other texts that make the point that when God creates, he's displaying his power, his greatness, his glory, which would be an argument to keep it. Or if we see that it has connections with the expansion of the universe, that'd be another argument to keep it. And if it's neither, we can throw it away. Is there any time that God is not displaying his power and glory? <laughs> well, <clears throat> you know, looking ahead as to where I think we're going to go with this study, it begins with God's statements about the beginning of the universe. And yeah, basically what Isaiah is bringing out, okay, uh, God displays his glory in everything that he does about the beginning of the universe, but you're going to see that throughout everything he creates. It's a pervasive principle. But that principle is established in the beginning of the universe, in which case we probably ought to keep this text because you know, it will be part of that argument. Okay. <clears throat> Isaiah 18.4. Do we have a volunteer to read that one? Eighteen. Eighteen four. For thus says, for thus the Lord has told me, I will look for my dwelling place quietly, like dazzling heat in the sunshine, like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. Okay. What do you think? Relevant or not? Okay, a lot of people are shaking their heads. Does anybody even think there's a possibility it should be included? Okay, that one's gone. Isaiah 37, 16. Thank you. <clears throat> o Lord of hosts, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, and all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty explicit, isn't it? <laughs> Oh, we got somebody. This, no, no. <laughs> okay, somebody kidding us here. All right. So, 3716 stays. What about 3726? Do we have a volunteer for 3726? I know you're all reading. I just want someone to actually come up here. <laughs> you're going to come up? Okay, great. Thank you. Thirty-seven twenty-six. Here, use the microphone. Thirty-seven twenty-six. Hast thou not heard long ago how I have done it, and of ancient times that I have formed it? Now have I brought it to pass that thou shouldest be to lay waste the feast cities into ruinous heaps. Okay, I think that one's going to have a lot to do with what it refers to. Yeah, the, previous verses are important. the previous verses are important. Okay, Mark? Oh, so I what's it? I don't have them on here yet. <laughs> okay, you need to get your smartphone up and ready? All right. <laughs> Yeah, this passage would definitely be included if it actually referred to the, the universe. But if you look at the previous passages, what is it referring to? Yeah, talking about uh, the idols that were set up and how God is going to be judging that. Rivers of Egypt, the forests, etc. So, uh, yeah, probably that one does not get included. And uh, what about Isaiah 38, 8? Anybody want to read 38, 8 for us? I'll read it. 
Okay, thank you. From ESV. Pardon me? From ESV. Yeah, that's fine. Behold, I will make the shadow cast by the declining sun on the dial of Ahaz turn back ten steps. So the sun turned back on the dial the ten steps by which I had declined, which it had declined. Okay, what do you think? Keep it or not? Somebody wants to keep it, anybody not want to keep it? It's not about making the universe. What is it all about? Okay. Yeah. I mean, to really settle this, you've got to read all of Isaiah 38 and all of Isaiah 39. Isaiah 38 and 39, what is the story that's going on? And incidentally, you also see it in the, uh, in the historic books as well. It's about Hezekiah's illness. Okay, and uh, what's the story about Hezekiah's illness? Yeah, he was going to die. How old was he when God told him, you're going to die? 39. He was 39 years of age. I could all ask you a question. How many of you are older than 39? But I won't do that. <laughs> but at least a few of you here are over 39. Or can you imagine being 39 years of age and uh, God telling you, get your household in order, you're going to die? It's like, hey, I got my 401k, it's not really ready yet. And <laughs> so... Uh, I really want to be around to, to see my sons and daughters married, see my grandkids, and none of that's going to happen. And so, and moreover, was Hezekiah a good king or a bad king? A very good king. And what did he say to the Lord? He says, I want to live because I want to continue doing good uh, for the kingdom of Judah and on your behalf. And, you know, I've been a worthy servant. Why, God, aren't you giving me more time to fulfill your purpose? And so what did God do? He says, I'm going to give you 15 more years. Now, I could ask the question, how many of you here are older than 54? But I won't do that either. Because, <laughs> you know, 54, yeah, that seems pretty young to be told, hey, you know, uh, it's going to go away. So, but yeah, God said, I'm going to give you 15 more years. And then he said, what sign do you want that what I'm doing really is a miracle? And Hezekiah said, I don't need a sign. Your word is good enough for me. But God says, I'm going to give you a sign anyway. And he says, the shadow of your sundial, uh, which way do you want it to go? And Isaiah said, well, if you're talking a miracle, make it go backwards. I mean, after all, <laughs> going forward, all I've got to do is wait 40 minutes. It's going to go forward anyway. And so God actually has a shadow go backwards as if it's backwards 40 minutes in time. Now, is that relevant to the creation of the universe? No. no. Okay. But it's a great story, right? <laughs> okay. Before we leave that great story, uh, why was God upset that Isaiah prayed so bitterly, give me more time? Okay. Because God knew what would happen if he let Hezekiah live another 15 years or even another 10 years. Now, during those 15 years, Hezekiah lived his life before the Lord. He fulfilled his promise to God. Uh, he was a righteous king, led the nation in righteousness, turned many uh, into repentance. But there was one significant factor during those 15 years that proved a disaster uh, for the kingdom of Judah. Manasseh. Manasseh was born during those 15 years. If Hezekiah had gone when God told him to go at age 39, there would have been no Manasseh. Now, Manasseh reigned longer than any other king of Judah, and he was an evil king, except for his last couple of years. The wonderful thing about Manasseh, he repented of all the evil he did before he passed away, had a complete change of heart. And it's a remarkable story of how Manasseh turned around and how God blessed him. However, it was catastrophic to the Jewish nation because during those five decades that uh, Manasseh had reigned, a lot of people were led away from the Lord and never came back. Manasseh came back, but most of the people that he had steered in the wrong direction did not come back. So yeah, and it literally took generations 
uh, for the kingdom to recover. Well, that took us a little bit off topic. Yes? <coughs> well, that was it, because uh, after Manasseh passed away, there were several more kings of Judah. Only one of them was a good king. That was Josiah. And some have argued of all the kings of Judah, he was the best. I mean, maybe David, but I mean, once you had the, uh, the kingdom split into two, nobody comes close to Josiah and being really committed to the Lord. But it was like uh, too late. So much damage had happened, he was not able to turn the nation around. Which I think is something about our nation today. I mean, we need to look at what's happened to our nation and say, hey, you know, it's getting to the point where it might be too late to turn things around. I was just reading a report uh, the other day. Uh, now more than half the population of Americans are born out of wedlock. <coughs> Never before in the history of the United States has that been true, <coughs> where half the people that are born are born out of wedlock. Also, then an interesting statistic, uh, we are now have the highest unemployment rate of uh, men in the history. It's even higher than it was during the Depression. So, now, we have employment, <coughs> but it's basically women working and a lot of men not working. So, so ones that yeah, I mean, we have a low unemployment rate today, but there's a lot of men who are choosing not to work at all. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Back to the text. Moving on to Isaiah 40. As you can see, we got a lot of passages in Isaiah 40. How many of them are relevant? Isaiah 40, verse 4. <laughs> every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord is spoken. That's Isaiah 4 and verse 5. Incidentally, uh, there was a famous composer that uh, used this. Yeah, it's in Messiah's handle, right. And if you're familiar with Messiah uh, and that part of uh, uh, the, uh, yeah, is this relevant to the universe? Okay. <clears throat> I'm reading out of the 1984 internet, New International Version. Uh, but yeah, as you look at the context of these first few verses of four, Isaiah 40, this is a prophecy. And that's why uh, it's in Handel's Messiah, because he looked at this as a prophecy. So, and incidentally, it's cited in the New Testament, <coughs> this, this particular text. But yeah, it's a prophecy. It's not referring to the beginning. You might make a case that it might have a reference to the ending, uh, but not the beginning. Okay, moving into Isaiah 40, 22. 40, 12, pardon me, 40, 12 to 17. Sorry about that. Okay, and the, the challenge here is, are all of these verses relevant? Some or none? That's the challenge. Now, I'm going to want someone to come up and read 12 to 17. My asthma is kicking in, so I'm not going to be able to do it. Come on up. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by the span and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure and weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has informed him with whom did he consult and who gave him understanding? And who taught him in the path of justice and taught him knowledge and informed him of the way of understanding? Verse 15? Oh, oh 17. Says, okay. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. Behold, he lifts up the islands like fine dust. Even Lebanon is not enough to burn, nor its beasts enough for burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. Okay. 
So, do you think all of that is relevant or just some? Okay. I think 12 is definitely relevant. 12 is definitely relevant? Yeah, because 12 talks about, if not explicitly about the beginning of the universe, is actually talking how God creates. So that how component is important. So definitely verse 12. Uh, anybody want to argue for some more verses besides 12? What about 15? What about 15? Good point. Gary, make your case. Well, it's, uh, it's uh, talking about the creation event as uh, making a measure of it. Okay, that's a good point. In other words, as God creates the universe, it's making the point of how carefully he goes about it. He actually has his measuring stick, and so everything is basically making a fine-tuning argument. You know, it's not just God poof, throwing it out there. This is something he carefully fine-tunes uh, for our benefit. And so, verse 15, yes? Uh, I'm voting for verse 17. Okay. Because the, there's the line, they are counted by him as less than nothing and emptiness, which sounds like a line out of uh, talking. Or, <laughs> or Lawrence Krauss, right? <laughs> so... No, you don't think so, Gary? No, no. Yeah. He's just talking about the nations. Talking about the nations. No, I think well, 17, and 18, 17 and 18 should not be included, but they give a good overview of <coughs> what this section of 40 through 55 chapters are about. Mm -hmm. uh, 18, to whom will you liken God compared to us puny people? And he uses the universe to, to explain that. Yeah. So that's a good point, uh, because basically making a point, hey, uh, look at you, look at me, look at what I've done. Can you do this? I mean, can we humans create a universe? I know they're trying to do that at uh, uh, the Large Hadron Collider. That's a joke. <laughs> but you'll see that on the Internet. Yeah. Yeah, people are worried they're going to make a black hole or bring a new universe, but uh, not the case. And that's a rumor running around the Internet, by the way, that we are on the verge of actually making a universe in the lab. Here's how you can dispel that. We astronomers routinely observe parts of the universe where the energy densities are orders of magnitude greater than anything that's achievable in the Large Hadron Collider. And we don't see black holes coming into existence. We don't see new universes coming into existence. We don't see any new space-time realms. So don't panic about what's happening there in Switzerland. <laughs> it's not going to be the end of the world. It might be the end of some of your tax dollars, but it won't be the end of the world. <laughs> yeah, let's not go there. Okay. But you're making a good case that uh, there's some relevance in verse 18. So. If that's the most, okay, I wasn't going to put it for, but if you like it, that's great. Well, I think we can definitely make a case for 12 and 15. Yeah, and maybe we should let the rest go. So. And chances are that point that you're raising is going to be found in other passages. We'll see. Okay. That which brings us to 4022. Hopefully there won't be a lot of debate on 4022. So I'd like to read that for us. Thank you. Um, NIV. He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. And its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. So I really think that's a slam dunk. Okay, that gets included. Okay. Uh, verse 26. Yes. Uh, reference to the circle of the earth in this context. Yes. Do you think that could be used legitimately to support a spherical earth or not? Well... What's interesting about that passage, and notice we got a question that deals with whether or not uh, what Isaiah's got to say about the shape of the earth. Because, you know, something new on the, that's been around for the past year, you actually got both atheists and Christians arguing for a flat earth. Well, I think the atheists are role playing. Uh, <laughs> and what's interesting is that both sides will cite this text. And so the flat earth people will say, yeah. A circle that's two-dimensional. It's not three-dimensional. And so, and then people who say this shows that the Earth is spherical are saying, well, if you've got God above looking down on an object, only a sphere looks like a circle from all perspectives. 
What we're going to discover is the Hebrew word there, it can mean circle, it can also mean orb. Okay, so a lot of these debates that go on are based on the fact people reading the English translation and not realizing the Hebrew word definitions are a lot more expansive than we see in English. And once you recognize that, it can settle that. Yeah, so it could just as well be translated, God sits above the earth and looks down on the orb of the earth, which would be an explicit statement that it's a sphere, but it's either a sphere or a circle. But yeah, only a sphere looks like a circle from all perspectives above. So, I mean, you look at the moon, it always looks like a circle, right? Whether you're on the back side, the front side, sideways, whatever. Uh, astronauts have been around it. Always looks like a circle. The only way it would always look like a circle is if indeed the moon is spherical. So, okay. We have another circle. Got another all circle. Clock. It's always round. It's always round. <laughs> it never goes backwards. You. Yeah, and the clock just keeps advancing, and we're out of time. But you know, we covered almost all of these today. Yeah. So, and here are the rest we need to cover. So uh, we're going to get through this, and then we get to study it. And kind of what I'm going to be doing, I'm actually going to show you slide by slide uh, the different passages, and then we're going to have a, a discussion. And I'm going to kind of keep this up. I'm going to be throwing questions at you to try to get you to analyze these texts. But here's the exercise. When we start going through the actual text, the challenge is how do we integrate all these passages in Isaiah about the beginning of the universe to get a biblically correct picture of what the Bible is saying about the beginning of the universe. Because you're not going to get it from just one text. And Isaiah really does give us a complete picture of what the Bible says about the beginning of the universe. Of all the books of the Bible, Isaiah says more about the beginning of the universe, more detail about the beginning of the universe, than literally the rest of the books of the Bible combined. So that's why we're going to be spending some time on Isaiah because it's got a lot to say about these specifics. And what's really amusing to me, just a couple of weeks ago, I was on a university campus uh, debating another Christian research scientist who said, the Bible is silent on the universe. Well, I think Isaiah says otherwise. And I brought up Isaiah, and he said, well, it's all poetry. But you know what? Hebrew poetry is not like English poetry. It's very powerful. We're going to see just how powerful Hebrew poetry is in giving us specifics about the doctrines of creation and especially the doctrine of the Trinity. The most definitive texts of all on the doctrine of the Trinity are in the book of Isaiah. And my friend, uh, David Block, who was raised an Orthodox Jew and became a Christian, he became a Christian through studying these Isaiah texts on the Trinity. And I said, well, why did you study those texts? He says, those are the texts my rabbi forbid me to read. <clears throat> and as a rebellious young Orthodox Jew, I says, hey, if I'm not allowed to read these texts, I'm going to look at them and see what they've got to say. So and that brought them to faith in Christ. Anyway, let me close in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this amazing prophet that you raised up. And Lord, how you called him uh, to an incredible ministry uh, over several decades of his life under four different kings. And Father, uh, how you uh, had him uh, experience great persecution, that Lord used that persecution to have a powerful impact on the nation of his time, and not just his time. Lord, thank you for raising up Isaiah to be a prophet to all generations, even here in the 21st century. And Lord, I pray as we go through these texts, it'll equip us in a powerful way 